you went out to Northern Ireland. What did you experience out there? Shot at. Um, scared. Terribly scared in Northern Ireland because when you used to patrol around the streets. I was um, by then the quartermaster, an officer, and it was my job to supply the battalion, which was spread all over Belfast. So every evening I had to go around the street, go around and supply the battalions and the um, troops with what they wanted. And the only way to do it was to go in a Land Rover, which was an open Land Rover, <coughs> with a tailboard down. And although one, as an officer, one would always expect to sit in the front, on those situations, if someone got to stand on the tail completely open to the weather and to bombs and things, it had to be the officer. So you spend a lot of time going around Belfast, standing on the tail border, um, watching out for things, hearing bombs, perhaps getting involved in bombs on two or three occasions, getting shot at but missed, luckily missed. Um, it was it was scary, but in all situations, no matter how scary, there's fun. There's a great deal of, of amusement. Um, let me think of things as well. There was the contractor who was supposed to be doing some work in one of my camps and he kept missing the time, missing the target. And I finally caught up one day and said, Murphy, you haven't done that job. And he said, no. I said, when are you going to do it? He said, Thursday. I said, is that a promise? He said, yes, sir. And as I tried to walk away, he shouted after me, but don't keep me to it, will you? That's, that's the true Irishman. Um, there's things like that. So... What was it like in Belfast? Scary, but as always, with a great deal of fun as well. What was the barracks like that you were staying in? I've been in tents in the desert. Um, I've been in Korea, in um, dugouts, in the back of trenches. In Canada, I've been in a luxurious flat, which was given to me for a while. Um, in the town of London, I had a most incredible flat with my wife. In fact, so good was it that we worked out that it wasn't until about 18 years later, after a constant promotion, that we got another place, anything like as good as that. So some good, mostly bad. When you was out in Northern Ireland, did you develop a relationship with any of the local people? No. Um, one couldn't. I was invited out to dinner once and I asked my commanding officer if I could go and he said yes. And um, the chap who had invited me to dinner was a magistrate and I realised very soon after getting there that he was a bigot. He couldn't hear anything good to be said about the Catholics. He said that we'd done wrong instead of um, protecting the Catholics. We shouldn't have done that. And I decided then that I wouldn't Try to mix up with them, mix with them anymore. Just wasn't on. Did you feel sorry for any of the civilians out there? Oh, terribly sorry. I mean, imagine <clears throat> your mother. Maybe the father's in the house. Maybe he's not. Maybe he's in prison. Long course. You've got four kids, probably four under six, and at two o'clock in the morning, there's a banging on the door. The kids start screaming, and when the doors open, in a storm, six soldiers led by an officer or a sergeant to search the house. And there are these kids screaming, sitting on the sofa, wondering what's going on in their lives. Yeah, you feel sorry for them. Terribly, terribly sorry for them. They didn't deserve that, but that's what happened. Would you say you got treated well out whilst you was out there? I can't say the people who shot at you were treating you very well. But, um... Yes, by and large, the Irish were nice people, you know, nice people. Yes, one did get treated for that. After Northern Ireland, did you do any more active service? Um, no, didn't, no. What would you say the, your best experience of being in the army was? I know exactly what it was, because although I was a quartermaster and came through the ranks, and when I was a major, under very unusual circumstances, which I don't think has ever happened before, I found myself commanding a battalion of 800 men in Belfast. And that was fun, to be the commanding officer 
in a situation like that, oh, it was great. So is 800 the highest amount of men you've mm -hmm. commanded? Yeah, the high, my, the high point was for about eight weeks when I was commanded to tell him. Okay. When you were 55, you retired. Did you want to carry on or were you made to retire? I had to retire. I retired at 65. Um, I retired at, for a colonel. I had to retire from active service at 55. But I was very, very lucky because I was offered a job commanding this headquarters where we're sitting now for an extra 10 years. So I managed to stay until I was 65. But um, I'd still be here now if I hadn't sacked me. So do you say when you come here it was a good experience or would you have rather been in the army? Would I have rather been in the army? I thought I was in the army. No, like when you come here after... Oh well, yeah, it's, it's called a retired officer, I suppose. So to all intents and purposes you are in the army still. <clears throat> Um, and you don't wear uniform. Well, you know, even more uniform for special occasions. But it's um, it's a strange thing. It's a retired officer's job, and um, you do normal things. The only good thing about it is that they can't send you to Belfast anymore. They can't send you abroad. You stay in that one place for ten years, which was here. Imagine she had been come here with my wife, and years and years later, I'd come back to work in the same place. It's great. So what role did you play whilst you were here? I was area secretary, it means I looked after all regimental affairs in London. Do you know Major Boastquick? No. He's um, downstairs, he works, you know um, Dale? Yeah. Dale works for him. I had that job, he's he was most successful. Okay, um, was it more relaxed at the tower than being a soldier, you'd say, yeah? Yes. Uh, what things do you still do linked to the fusiliers? I'm chairman of one regimental committee, and I'm a trustee of the museum. Have you seen the museum? Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, I'm a trustee of the museum. Um, what else am I? And I'm a member of the regimental council. There, there, there are regimental things to do. I do other things outside. Um, I run a charity, um, which I formed about 20 years ago, because one day, sitting in the office, just along the corridor here. <clears throat> I was giving lunch to an old friend and his new wife. And I had a terrible headache. And I, there's a flat along there, which used to be known as the Colonel's Flat, I know it's called now. And I said to my secretary, I'm going to lie down, I've got a headache. My wife, luckily, was coming to lunch too. She came in and said, where is he? And my secretary said, he's got a bit of a headache. He's lying down. But I've given him two, I suppose he should be right soon. My wife came in, saw me lying on the bed, and said she knew immediately it wasn't just something could cure by two, I suppose. In fact, she said that I sat up in bed and said, do something, I think I'm having a brain hemorrhage. And she said, this was absolutely right, and he can't even read a thermometer. But he knew what was happening. So I was taken away um, to hospital, and lots of things went on in hospital. I had two lots of brain surgery. And um, in thanks for being, for surviving, and no one else thought I would, we started a charity called Head First, and I still run that. You said you were the chairman of the Royal Fusiliers Memorial Chapel. What do you do as part of that? Very little. Hmm. I choose the hymns. I am um, once a year when we go on Remembrance Day. I read the lesson. That's it. Would you say the regiment is still important to you? Oh, incredibly so. I mean, I, this regiment, like lots of others, um, has a great tradition of sons following fathers. <coughs> when I was stationed in Brunei, Borneo, my son came out for a, um, a visit. And I said, Simon, you've got less than a year to do at uh, Balliol, who's at Balliol College, Oxford. What are you going to do? And he said, I'm not sure, Dad. And I said, what about the regiment? Thinking, ah, oh, no. And he looked at me very sadly and sweetly. He said, Dad, I realise now for 19 years you've think, been thinking about me joining your regiment, haven't you? And I said, yes. He said, it's never crossed my mind. <laughs> so that was a grave disappointment. But yes, the regiment still means a great deal to me. That's why today is an incredibly important day, because you know there's great changes going on in the Army, and they're all being announced today. We have two battalions, and they're going to cut one of them. One of the battalions is going.
So, so yes, the important. In fact, the most important thing sometimes about an officer, if you met someone and said, um, what's your regiment? And you say, I'm a fusilier. And you say, do you know so-and-so? They say, no, no, he's not a fusilier. What's his regiment? That's the most important thing. What's his regiment? What does he do? And if you if it gives a regiment, then you say, well, I don't know him, but do you know he? he's in that regiment? So the regiment is absolutely vital.